Good afternoon and welcome to this IFG live event, What Next for the Northern Ireland Protocol. The protocol came into force on the 31st of December and with it new checks and processes on goods moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. It's had a rocky first six weeks. Uh, the beginning of the year saw cancelled deliveries and retailers temporarily pulling some products from Northern Ireland stores and some empty shelves in supermarkets. Although the Secretary of State for the Northern Ireland blamed COVID rather than Brexit for some of this disruption. The EU surprised everyone when only a month into the protocol's operation, it invoked Article 16, the protocol's safeguarding mechanism, to unilaterally disapply elements of the agreement as part of new vaccine export controls. After strong objections from Dublin, Belfast and London, the move was quickly reversed. But calls from, for the UK government to invoke Article 16 have grown, particularly amongst Northern Ireland's unionist communities, with the DUP now adopting this as their official position. Nonetheless, last week we saw the UK and the EU reiterate their commitment to implementing the protocol and they also promised to intensify work to find solutions to some of the problems seen on the ground through the UK-EU Joint Committee. So at this event we just aim to focus on how the protocol can be made to work as best as it can. To discuss this I'm joined by an excellent panel. Uh, first we have Aidan Connolly, Director of the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium. We have Professor Katie Hayward, Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's University Belfast and Senior Fellow at the UK and the Changing Europe. Um, Neil Richmond, TD for Dublin Rathdown and Fine Gael spokesperson on European Affairs. And finally, Simon Hoare, Conservative MP for North Dorset and Chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee. Uh, before we get going, uh, just a reminder this event is on the record. The recording will be available immediately after on YouTube and will also be uploaded, uploaded to our IFG podcast channel. Uh, please do tweet along using the hashtag, um, hashtag IFG Brexit. Um, and we're also taking questions via Slido. So to submit your questions, please go to www.slido.com and enter the code protocol. Uh, the details you should also be able to see on your screen. So please do send them in and we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, so to kick off, I wanted to talk about how the protocol has been operating so far. Um, so we've had some conflicting reports about um, whether there's been much disruption and what the cause of that disruption has been. As I mentioned, um, there's some suggestion that some of that might be due to COVID rather than Brexit or the protocol itself. Um, but more recently, Michael Gove did say that there were difficulties that were affecting people's daily lives. Um, so if you can start with you, Aidan, how is the protocol working for Northern Ireland businesses on the ground? Well, I think um, we have to be very pragmatic. Uh, about this. There are those people who are saying there's no border on the Irish Sea uh, and they're completely wrong. And there are those people who are saying that we're starving and that is completely wrong as well. Uh, so what, what we need to do is have this sort of realistic view. Um, so there were challenges, there still are challenges, um, but it's a testament to the hard work of people within the retail industry and within uh, uh, logistics that things are the way that they are. The average supermarket has somewhere between 40,000 and 50,000 different product lines. There was only ever uh, several hundred that were missing. So th this was a choice issue. This was not a, a food shortage issue. And we have to be very, very clear about that. Now, was it just because of the protocol? Well, you got to remember, um, there were those uh, seven days that there was no EU to GB food coming in and, and ingredients coming in quite simply because of, of COVID restrictions. Now that not only meant that uh, Northern Ireland wasn't getting stuff that way, but it also meant that there was knock on because of ingredients and therefore things weren't made and, and, and yada yada yada. It, it takes time for everything to, to get back up and, and running. Also, Northern Ireland is in a lockdown, so we are not eating out. We are, and, and you know, everyone is buying from the supermarkets. And quite frankly, in January time, you usually have some sort of things that are missing anyway. At that time of the year, we are out of our growing season. 90% of our lettuce, 80% of our tomatoes, 65% of our fresh fruit and veg are coming uh, via the land bridge uh, from the EU anyway. So there is always uh, the, those sort of uh, difficulties. So quite quite simply, you know, there, there are difficulties. They, it's, it's, um, how would I put it, the business community has been working really, really hard uh, to make sure that um, we are doing the best that we can. We've had to get used to new computer systems, uh, new ways of trading, um, even on parcels. We only found out 18 hours before the end of the transition period what the new rules and parcels have been. So actually, I think uh, Northern Ireland business has uh, coped quite well. However, there are 
uh, extra frictions and problems that are on the horizon, which I'm sure you're going to cover off later. Great, thank you. So some disruption, but but not not to be overstated, I think is what I, what I took from that. Um, Simon, I know your committee has been taking a lot of evidence um, on the functioning of the protocol um, since it came into effect. What's your assessment of, of the situation? And also, how do you think, how well do you think the UK government has handled preparations for the implementation of the protocol? Well, let's take the last question uh, first. I mean, back in the summer, the, my committee was arguing and making the case that business needed to know very early on or as soon as possible the regime that under which it would need to be trading and that was applicable for British business as it was for Northern Irish business. Of course the protocol only agreed in early December so I think what we can say is uh, that only just a few weeks into its operation is it working uh, as well as it can? No. Are there needs for tweaks and, and uh, creases to be sorted out? Uh, yes. That's not a surprise. Uh, what I think is amazing is just how quickly, uh, as Aidan was just saying, uh, business and others are getting their head around what needs to be done in order to trade uh, correctly and, and, are, and are doing so. And I think what is uh, incredibly helpful is the reaffirmed commitment to making the protocol work, um, stated by uh, the UK government and by uh, the EU just in recent And that, I think, should concentrate all of us of now making sure the best as it can, rather than trying to undermine it, uh, disrupt it, or hope and pray that it disappears. It's clearly not going to do so. We now must focus on making it work properly. Great, thank you. And Katie, I know you were following uh, closely the guidance that the UK government was issuing um, before uh, the end of the year, um, and what was missing, I think, is especially. Um, obviously, to some extent, some problems have been created by businesses not yet knowing how to comply um, with the new requirements. But there are also changes to the way that businesses um, in Great Britain trade with Northern Ireland in terms of new processes um, and, and paperwork. Um, that might mean that some adjustments to businesses, um, to supply chains are necessary. So I guess my question is, to what extent do you think that this is teething problems? And to what extent do you think there are some perhaps more fundamental changes that, that need to happen to make this work? Yeah, um, thanks, Jess. Well, I mean, I'd like to pay tribute, um, if this doesn't seem like sucking up, but to Aidan and his colleagues, um, the business community has really worked hard and um, tirelessly for, for, for many, many months now to try and make sure that the protocol um, is operated as smoothly as possible. Um, but they have their hands tied to some degree by what the government, uh, what information is there. Um, and as has already been said, the information was slow to come. It was difficult to find um, for one thing, um, and except for those of us who are sad enough to sort of <laughs> looking uh, on the information issued sometimes several times a day. So it was, it was quite late in the day that they began to put the information relating to the protocol on a dedicated page. That kind of thing made a big difference. But more generally, we had the challenge of communication around it all and the um, uncertainty. I think this gets to the point of the, the, the difficulty around the protocol because as I've said many times before, it is a compromise and a rather awkward one. Um, and we have a situation in which of course the EU is continually emphasizing the need for rigorous enforcement and implementation because the EU member states are very concerned about Northern Ireland being a risk. Um, and then of course on the UK side, we have rather different incentives and motivations, which is to downplay the significance of the protocol. So I think a big part of the challenge that people were dealing with come the 1st of January was the lack of awareness in GB about um, the particular rules that would apply for moving goods into NI. Um, plus, of course, the fact that much of the crucial decisions came late in the day, um, including those grace periods, and that was pretty short notice. Thank goodness we had them. And in terms of the, teach the teething problems, I think a, a bit of the, uh, quite a bit of the tension and anxiety that's present at the moment which uh, we may talk about this more generally. I, it's, it's not necessarily a general um, feeling amongst the population, um, but I think it is a sense of, well, these grace periods are gonna come to an end. And we know that the EU will um, expect rather different practice at the end of that, those grace periods. And mm -hmm. I think this is part of the anxiety around the implementation of the protocol that we actually know things are going to get worse. 
Thanks, Katie. I think that's a very good point. As you say, we haven't seen all aspects of the protocol in operation yet, um, and we'll definitely come on to some of the possible um, solutions or um, extensions that, that might be agreed in that space. Um, but just before we move on to that, Neil, um, I just wanted to ask whether um, the Republic of Ireland has experienced um, how they've experienced the, some of the knock on effects, either of the protocol um, or Brexit more generally. And we have a question here um, from anonymous um, that asks, um, what are the biggest concerns of traders who use the land bridge? Um, and to what extent um, is that become a problem for traders in the Republic of Ireland? Yeah, to be quite frank, the land bridge has become a bit of a problem. And we've started to see the material shift away from going, be it Dublin Hollyhead or Rosslare Fishguard Pembroke to people going direct to the continent. We've seen ferry operators move their ferries from our Ireland to GB routes to Ireland to France, the Netherlands, Spain, uh, Belgium routes, and that is, there is going to be huge movement. A lot of the time prior to the 31st of December, those of us in government circles were encouraging exporters, our biggest market is the continental EU, um, to move to direct shipping where they can. That isn't always appropriate for certain uh, products, but as always referred to that sort of seven day period where movement um, into France from GB was stopped over Christmas, that really put the frighteners up a lot of exporters and we're starting to see that shift. The delays have probably been on incoming goods from GB, but they are very small, so far smaller than anything that was experienced in Northern Ireland, but certain products and certain British retailers, um, there was huge concerns about Percy Pigs and Marks and Spencers, thankfully clarified that it was Percy Pig style Easter eggs uh, that might have a bit of an issue with but more seriously we did see on the first day of trading and um, the first of january six lorries were turned back from hollyhead port because they simply didn't have their paperwork in order and we definitely got a distinct sense from companies based in gb that they simply hadn't prepared or they weren't aware of what they needed to do we'd been running quite a long getting brexit ready campaign here over three million euro invested based on the idea or the notion that look there's going to be a hard Brexit, possibly a no deal Brexit, you know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And um, where we're starting to see the knock on now, a lot of the issues in terms of documentation and form filling and revenue officials at the ports have been addressed. And um, now that our lorry drivers going direct to the continent need uh, PCR tests, we've rapid or antigen tests, we've rapid testing on site. But it's now the individual consumer, customer <clears throat> who are ordering from amazon.co.uk or ASOS are starting to get a fright that no longer something that they would have had delivered regularly just isn't being sent um, or the company has decided to, you know, that they, instead of getting it in three to four days, it'll be 12 to 15 days. And crucially, a lot of people are finding that when the parcel arrives, they're liable for quite a large VAT bill. And that's quite a concern. And that's all the issues that we're trying to educate people in terms of buyer beware. But obviously the fact that we're in level five of a, a COVID lockdown means a lot of people are ordering online. So they're being forced into decisions they don't want to make. Thank you. Um, just to come back to uh, the issue that Katie, you were talking about on grace periods. Um, obviously, the three month exemption for agri food paperwork for supermarkets is due to end in April. Um, we know that the UK government um, is asking for an extension of, of, of that, but we obviously that's not guaranteed to happen. Um, just wanted to ask uh, Aidan first, how concerned are you about the end of the grace period and kind of what do you expect to happen if there is no other agreement um, to either extend or to find some kind of long-term solution before April. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> Perhaps, Katie, uh, you, you might want to, to answer that. I was just thinking, I was glad that you asked Aidan that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <who's> um, that? <laughs> he's, he's having trouble with the sound, I think. Can you hear? Um, uh, well, I will endeavour to answer it. So the question is, what, what if there's no extension to the grace period? Yes, yeah. Well, I think, um, uh, to be fair, I mean, th it was quite clear there was unilateral declarations that were part of the joint decisions. Um, they were saying, and the UK government is explicit, that it, these things would not be renewed. So in principle, the UK government um, uh, and businesses have been expecting that these grace periods will come to an end um, at the point uh, um, for each of them in, in, in turn. Um, and so 
those measures that we have in place to try and um, enable businesses to adjust to um, the new arrangements post uh, grace period are there, um, including the uh, movement assistance scheme, for example, to help cover the costs of um, export health certificates. Um, and I, I think, uh, having said that, though, I mean there are. It is seriously a, a huge um, ask. Of, of businesses, um, and most particularly um, given the nature, and Aidan will speak more to this, given the nature of trade across the Irish Sea, um, I think there's sort of, um, I mean, this is putting it very general, generally, but I, um, the relief in getting an agreement, um, both the TCA and the, the agreement around those decisions about implementing the protocol, possibly led people to downplay or under underestimate what was being asked in terms of um, the movement of goods from GB to NI, in the nature of that trade, because it, we don't have that type of trade across an EU external border. Um, so always and um, the need for flexibility and imagination is there. Um, and the hope would be that through the mechanisms for um, um, adjustment, as we see in the joint committee, it has that um, capacity to make decisions that will enable the um, uh, movement of goods between GB and I to be as, um, uh, as in accordance with the UK internal market as possible. Um, th so that flexibility is there and the hope that that would um, be uh, met by those agreements to come yet still from the Joint Committee. Excellent, sir. A very good answer. I'm, you needn't have been worried about me asking, asking you it, I don't think. <laughs> uh, Simon, I, I understand you wanted to, to come in on that point. Yes, if, if I may, I mean, I, I think this is an interesting point about the grace period, and it's one where certainly my thinking has evolved since the start of the year, really based on the evidence that we've been hearing in the committee. For a lot of people, they're using the, the grace period effectively in lieu as a, a, of a transition period, getting their head around what needs to be done, the rules and the regulations, um, etc. So I'm now persuaded that in actual fact, extension to the, the grace period, would be helpful to allow further crudity to be, to be ironed out. But I think if we go back to a point I was making a, a moment or so ago, which is the need for some business will invest and prepare in IT and in systems and in training staff, etc. They know very clearly what, what is that they need to be preparing for. A perpetual elongation of the grace period uh, it is like trying to pull the plaster off the wound really, really slowly. You know you've got to, it's got to come off and you know it's probably going to hurt, but it's got, to, it's got to be done. So maybe a short extension to the grace period to allow further education to be done, particularly with regards to business in GB. That, where, that really is where the big gap mm. of knowledge is. Uh, the businesses in Northern Ireland appear to have got their heads around it pretty quickly. Quite, uh, certainly the ports have, but businesses who are actually sending the stuff over have been understandably slow to, to, to getting their head around all of the finer points of detail. So I think an extension to the grace period would be helpful, but it's not a salve. It's not a perpetual salve. At some point, the grace period needs to end. The protocol needs to come into effect uh, fully, but as decreased and as de-teething problemed as it possibly can be. Uh, and, and I think that's what, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a phrase I will keep using, is what I think we should all be uh, working towards. Great, thank you, um, Simon. I think hopefully now we've got um, Aidan back and he can hear us. Um, so I'd be interested in, in whether you agree with that, Aidan, but also I expect that you'll be meeting um, with, uh, part of the meeting with uh, the uh, co-chair of, of the Joint Committee uh, tomorrow, um, so I was just wondering what's on your kind of top list? What will be your top asks um, in terms of either extensions or extra flexibilities or other things that could be done in the joint committee? Well, that's funny you should ask. I just happen to have something prepared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on, on, I, I, I totally agree with, with, with what Simon said. Um, the, the transition period was a, a, a complete misnomer. Um, but then again, the protracted negotiation period doesn't sound as good. Um, I, there, there's there's a real um, problem here in the short term, and then the medium term and, and, and the long term, and we have to look at it like that. So what 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 business needs is uh, summed up really in, in four four words. So that it's stability, and that means the immediate extension of those grace periods to allow us not only to continue to adapt to the new systems, but to find uh, longer term, and, and that's the second word, the certainty that comes from long-term 
workable solutions that are designed with business, things that are done with business rather than to uh, business. They need to use our technical expertise. We are the people that need to uh, deliver this and we can take it from regulation to uh, delivery. The third point is simplification. Um, and that can be anything from digitization at the lower end right up to uh, a veterinary agreement or a trusted trader. But trusted trader means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What we actually call it is an auditable and certified uh, supply chain, if, if you will, and that needs to be easy to, to access. But all these things remove friction. And it has to remember Northern Ireland is at very little risk uh, of, of uh, to the, the the single market or the, or the customs union, especially if you extrapolate out from that principle of dead end host, that things for retail going to Northern Ireland are staying in, retail, in, in Northern Ireland, and we have the the, the, the ability to, to prove that. Now, the, the last thing is that affordability, because all of these things are new, and um, just as Simon said, GB business is finding it slightly harder. Well some a lot more harder to, to deal with Northern Ireland because they've never had to do this before. None of them are, are, are essentially exporters. And to do this, it all needs to be affordable, uh, not just for business, but for Northern Ireland consumers who have half the discretionary income of uh, great British households. Now, people are saying that this, this can't be done and you know, this, and but where there is a will, there is a way. And the way that, you know, a, a very easy way of, of saying this, and, and I, I don't think it really got the uh, press that it should have yesterday, when the, the EU and, and, and the UK agreed data sharing. Mm -hmm. And there's a great principle there. The principle was that um, the EU allowed the data to flow, but the UK fulfilled that burden of proof to prove that, uh, that, that things are, are, are safe for the EU to do. So this is... There's two different ways of negotiating. The British government goes in with the list is this is what we want. The EU says this is the principle and extrapolated out. We in business in Northern Ireland have to work with both of those. Mm. Great, thank you. And, you know, um, Neil, I wanted to come to you next. I know that um, Aidan has just set out very clearly kind of what Northern Ireland businesses uh, want to see on the protocol. And the UK also, um, uh, Michael Gove in his letter set out some specific asks there. Um, we obviously know that the EU is keen to make sure that anything that it's done is within the existing parameters of, of EU law. But do you think there is a possibility that they might be willing um, to be a bit more flexible on this? And I suppose from your own personal perspective, do you think that they should be willing to be a bit more flexible? Yeah, I suppose it's, I don't want to come in with the cold dose of reality. Um, what Simon and Aidan lay out is very clear and very obvious, but, you know, it's it's a bit of the internal discussion in UK GBNI politics without realising, well, what is the position of the EU going to be? And we saw a lot of that uh, over the last couple of years. And to be quite frank, um, there isn't a great deal of appetite within the EU necessarily for this level of flexibility. Um, and we had Commissioner Sefcovic yesterday before our committee, and he was quite clear when I raised this with him. He said, well, there's a great deal of things that the British government still has to do. Uh, in terms of access to real-time uh, information, Belfast ports, access to uh, assessment agents, lots of fulfilling their obligations as is to the protocol. And certainly from an Irish government point of view within the EU, whilst we've always said, look, we will push for flexibility. I think Simon Coveney summed it up yesterday when he said, well, there may be modest flexibility or modest exemptions. And one fear that I have, and speaking frankly um, to a largely UK audience, is that the disaster that was the near triggering of the Article 16 by the EU, there is now a danger that the British government can push too far. And the tone of Michael Gove's letter certainly was very worrying. And looking outright for extensions to 2023, you know, I just think it, there's, there's a level of, yes, the EU made a mistake, the European Commission made a mistake, they rectified it within a couple of hours. But all of a sudden, on one hand, you have politicians in NI saying, well, that's the excuse that we now trigger Article 16 ourselves and abandon the protocol. And I just have this slight fear that there is the scope to push too far. And I think we need to be quite realistic. Now, in saying that, um, the EU appreciates that they need to approach this from a level of humility after that. And certainly the Irish government are quite keen that it's very easy to 
portray the European Commission in particular as being, you know, intransigent and dogmatic and inflexible. But there are certain things that need to be achieved first before we can get any uh, any sort of sight of any flexibility. But certainly within the EU, the Irish government are keen on that. I suppose one thing that we always have to remember when it comes to Brexit, the protocol distinctly affects Northern Ireland, it affects the Republic, it affects GB. Your average EU member state isn't really that interested but they are very interested in the protecting the single market and ensuring the principle of protecting the single market is maintained. Now, thankfully, the flip side of that is there's been absolute solidarity with successive Irish government positions in terms of protecting that relationship with Northern Ireland. But I certainly think we need a, a little dose of reality about what may be fe feasible. And if the EU doesn't react as exact as perhaps Michael Gove wants, it isn't from a position of intransigence we have to achieve what's set out in the protocol first and be a little bit realistic. Mm, thank you. And I think what's become very clear throughout the Brexit process and the negotiation of the protocol is that protecting the single market is clearly an EU red line. But um, similarly, um, protecting uh, regulatory autonomy or sovereignty is a UK red line. So I wanted to get on to talk a little bit about um, the possibility that this issue on agri-food could be resolved through the UK-EU agreement. Um, so we've had a question in uh, from uh, from John Pete, who asks um, whether um, if the UK agreed to follow EU uh, rules and SPS rules, whether that could help resolve the issue. Um, Simon, I wanted to come to you as to whether you think that there is any appetite with this um, for this in the UK government. Obviously, it could resolve some other issues that they've been facing, notably around um, Scottish seafood producers. Um, do you think that they will think about this particular proposal um, or do you think that it's, it's a non-starter? Well, I, I think in the spirit of pragmatism, everything has to be described as being um, on the table and worthy of discussion. Whether it's ultimately achievable, I don't know. Would, would it would it help? Um, it's another way of doing things, uh, and it would certainly make it uh, a little faster and a little less uh, clunky and uh, cumbersome. Uh, and I thought it was quite interesting, the, the evolution in the Northern Ireland uh, uh, economics minister, um, uh, Lady Dodds uh, mm -hmm. over the last sort of 24 hours yesterday uh, in the assembly was saying no um, this morning sort of saying well possibly but of course it all depends on what the Westminster government thinks uh, ab about it um, it goes to show that there can be some changes and, and some movement on these issues I, I think now the narrative changes slightly uh, the UK has clearly and firmly, you know, left the European Union. Brexit has been uh, delivered. If there are practical solutions to practical problems, which uh, you can throw the mantle if you wanted to over uh, with, with, um, with, with narrative about the integrity of the UK and, and those sorts of points, it's on the table. And I, I think it's worthy of discussion. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to come back to um, some of the implications of that um, EU, EU decision to trigger Article 16 or invoke Article 16. Um, and I think what we've seen is a, is a move in position, particularly from, from the DUP, in that you know, other solutions might not be possible. They're very keen that they want um, Article 16 to, to be invoked. Um, Katie, I wanted to ask you, we've got a question here from David Liddington, um, who asks what kind of words or actions would provide reassurance to a unionist community, which appears to be genuinely and deeply resentful over the protocol? Yes. So I think just to sort of put it in context a wee bit, I mean, uh, we do know that many um, in the DUP were calling for Article 16 to be triggered quite early on. Um, and uh, it's hard to overstate quite how significant it was, that misjudgment that came on the 29th of January, um, because it confirmed the worst fears about um, the situation in which Northern Ireland has been left. And I sort of want to pick up on what Neil was saying which gets to the, the heart of this challenge that we have, which is of course, you know, the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is a, is a, is, is a compromise reflecting the tenuous position of Northern Ireland and how integrated it is with Britain and with Ireland. And in many ways, the protocol does that too. Um, so we have, um, you know, we have a hardening of the sea border, but we also have a hardening of the land border as a consequence of Brexit. 
not for the movement of goods, but in other ways. Um, and it's a really uncomfortable position to be in, and it, and it feels uncomfortable for um, uh, Remainers and Leavers because it's a compromise on unionists and nationalists. And my worry about where we are now is that we've had this possible to have a zero sum calculation. Um, so there's a clear winner and clear loser as unionists see it. So I'm trying to explain the sort of unionist position here, which is that we have the sea border because you don't have the land border. And on top of this, um, we don't have any sense of ownership of the protocol here because nobody really wanted it. Nobody wanted to be, end up in this position, which um, I would really stress that both the UK government and the EU, um, they have a joint responsibility now not to just enforce the rules or indeed to, to uh, you know, uh, interpret them in, in, in loose ways, but actually to think about this as a democratic challenge um, and a challenge that relates to the nature of the peace process here in Northern Ireland. So if you have a situation where it's seeing that um, there's this, this, this win-lose uh, debate, and most particularly that um, uh, the EU is holding all the cards or is able to, for example, put in place as it's being interpreted, a hard land border just at whim without following the necessary procedures and consultation, et cetera. And of course, the, you know, the insecurities that already exist are simply amplified. So fundamentally, we need to get to the, hurry up and get to the position where um, the UK and the EU are thinking about this as um, uh, the compromise that they have reached and they have a responsibility to implement it now. And think about this realistically. Um, and the, the, the points that Aidan was making are important to pick up on uh, because these are practical solutions, recognizing the unique situation on the island of Ireland. So in terms of what happens now, I, I would be really keen to see um, a commitment to those democratic, um, as democratic as possible bodies that would be mechanisms that are there for hearing Northern Ireland's voice, not in an ad hoc way, but in a formal way where we can say, your representatives are here at the table and they are being heard. I mean, that kind of thing, because at the moment we're sitting in a situation mm -hmm. where it's hard for people to say, to stand in the middle ground and say, this is the way forward. The UK and the EU will agree and speak with one voice on this, that we have Northern Ireland's collective interests at heart. Um, and I think that's the kind of, we need to move beyond the win-lose debate, which is what we have at the moment still in the UK-EU relationship, because that's only going to do harm here in Northern Ireland, to the point of, well, emphasising the you know, flexibility as an imagination because we recognise our re responsibility to peace in Northern Ireland. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, Neil, I wanted to come to you uh, just now um, on kind of how, you know, Katie just mentioned how damaging that decision to, to trigger Article 16 was for the kind of political debate. Um, and I know yesterday um, you were speaking um, with uh, Seshkovich, who's talking about some of the measures that were being put in place to prevent that kind of oversight, as I think it was described, happening again. Um, do you think there is sufficient? And uh, what else do you think could be done to prevent things like this from happening by accident? Uh, no, there isn't sufficient oversight yet. Um, I am very confident that it will be there. I think one of the real, um, speaking wholly and solely from an Irish slash European point of view, one of the big issues that has emerged is this saw the EU completely cede any sort of moral high ground. For the last couple of years, be it in terms of the internal market bill, the Brexit decision itself, um, the checker solution, all these uh, alternative arrangements, and then in the last couple of weeks, references from the British government about Article 16, the EU has usually been quite consistent, but this completely threw that away. And as Katie said, it, it realised a lot of the fears that people had in Northern Ireland about what the concern was. So it, it's not, I cannot um, understate how furious the Irish government were what, with when this happened and how <laughs> the government within the EU are set to ensure that what has been agreed is a clearinghouse mechanism. Um, and I believe it's to be run through the Irish nominee to the European Commission's office, which is Mairead McGuinness, um, the Financial Services Commissioner. Personally, I'd like to see something a bit stronger. I'd like it to go straight to the member state government, because we saw uh, in the five hour period, Friday the 29th, that once Michal Martin, the Taoiseach, and indeed Simon Coveney, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, were dialed in, and indeed Michel Barnier, this was dropped rapidly. And we've had a two week uh, tour of apologies, although we still haven't exactly got who was responsible for this error um, and we probably won't. But it's to make sure that it 
doesn't happen again. But I just want to pick up on a couple of Katie's points because I think it's really important. Um, a lot of people were talking about the consent mechanism that goes with the protocol and the fact that we have Northern Irish Assembly elections and the Northern Irish Assembly can look at the protocol again in, in four years. I think there has to be responsibility from both the British government and the European Union. And this is where it gets constitutionally and legislatively a bit tricky, but I'd be very keen for genuine discussion. So Katie has rightly mentioned the various joint consultative committees. Um, we need to see them established. And what I put to Commissioner Seskovic yesterday is that they're formalized, that they're not always these rolling high drama, high stakes events that, you know, this is something it's simply taken as read that every second Tuesday, um, these are convened virtually or physically or once a month, uh, Michael Gove is in Brussels and the every other month, Mara Sefcovic is in um, London or wherever, but also that they travel to Belfast and Derry and Coleraine and lots of other places too. And I was very keen that the commissioner would meet with Northern Irish Assembly members. Um, and this is where it gets a bit tricky. Are you going past your remit democratically? But I think like the engagement that is going to be had with various business stakeholders, I think that's important because yes, there are a sector in the unionist communities, David pointed out, that are very concerned about this and just want the protocol gone. But I do think there's a sector, not necessarily political, but some political um, aspects of the unionist community who want their voice heard, want their concerns allayed, political, economic and otherwise. And that has to be with the European Commission as well as the British government. And I think the European Commission now, and I'm actually quite confident that Mara Sefcovic will sort of fulfill that kind of Michel Barnier role of reaching out as, to as many people as possible. That's something that really important that could come out of it. Because I've said a hundred times and getting sick of saying it, it's okay to make a mistake once you learn from your mistakes. Um, the European Commission is who needs to learn here. And certainly the Irish position isn't any different to any other member states. It's just it's more exposed to it. And despite certain reports and certain papers, there isn't any ire with the Irish government position or there isn't any vision. Once again, unnamed sources are claiming that Ireland is going to be the bus or something. I can confirm that that isn't the case. Thank you. Um, I wanted to get on to some of the questions about embedding Northern Ireland in the policy process that we've kind of touched on here. Obviously, in this particular example, it was the EU that perhaps hadn't considered uh, Northern Ireland aspects when making policy. Um, but I think we've seen examples throughout the Brexit process of where the UK government has been kind of equally vulnerable um, to overlooking certain um, certain factors specific to Northern Ireland or now its obligations un under the protocol. Um, Simon, I wanted to start with you. Um, one of the questions we had is around how um, Northern Ireland could be affected by future divergence between the UK and the EU. Um, do you have any thoughts on, on how Northern Ireland's obligations under the protocol should be taken into account in future policy making processes? And I suppose a kind of supplementary question to that kind of what role you think uh, Parliament and your committee in particular might have um, in, in that? Well, I, I think speaking to the to the general point and, and picking up on the point that uh, that Neil was making there a moment or so ago, um, there can be no harm in having conversations, and there can be no harm in having conversations with as, as wide a range of stakeholders and interested parties as possible. But it takes two to have a conversation. Um, if you have people who are, you know, uh, metaphorically outside waving a placard with their fingers in their ears, um, if that's physically possible to do two things at the same time. Um, they need to be in around the table, making a case passionately, forcefully, accepting decisions, whether they go in their favour or, or not is uh, remains to be seen. But everybody needs to be in having that sort of conversation because here is a here is a golden opportunity. And I think, you know, as, as soon as we can get these, and I don't say this to be dismissive, you know, these, these creases ironed out. Um, then business in Northern Ireland can start, you know, we're in a pretty unique position here. We have unfettered trade into GB. We have uh, unfettered trade into the uh, Republic and thereby um, the whole of the Euro European Union uh, single market. The, the, we could be on, Northern Ireland business could be on the cusp of an absolute golden age of growth and investment and job creation. KPMG has just announced, what, in the last 12 hours, the creation of 200 jobs uh, in, in, in Belfast. Let's now start concentrating on those and weave in as many people as possible. Because what I would like to see 
Um, and this may sound incredibly naive, given the level of, uh, of anger which is existing at the moment uh, among some of the uh, community in Northern Ireland, is that by the time we get to those assembly elections, by the time we get to the vote on the renewal of the protocol, um, it will be a non-issue because it will be working well, business will have got through it all, consumers will be confident, everybody knows what needs to be done. And so I think what we have to try and do is take quite a lot of the steam out of this. And I think you do take an awful lot of the steam out by having those conversations. Now, it's perfectly sensible and, and proper that uh, it is the Westminster government that negotiates uh, treaties and, and those sorts of things on behalf of the United uh, Kingdom. Um, that means, however, that there can still be lots of conversations between all the devolved countries within the UK uh, to make sure that everybody's voice is being heard as we go forward. Because we can either sit and moan about a hand of cards that we wished we'd been dealt and keep chucking them in and hoping the croupier is going to give us the winning hand, or we play the hand that we've been dealt and try and make the best of it as we can. And I think, you know, the protocol working well and the access to the two markets is, in the absence of anything else, workable as far as NI is concerned. Thank you. Aidan, I wanted to bring you in um, on this question about um, whether you have any specific thoughts about how Northern Ireland businesses should feed into these various processes. Um, obviously, in a lot of cases, there are opportunities, but there also might be challenges uh, created by being caught between two kind of different regulatory systems. Um, so that was kind of my first question, how you think um, businesses could feed in but also a question we've just had on the chat and something that uh, Simon alluded to there about kind of I think Michael Gove called it um, reaching the gin and tonic peanut stage of the protocol where things are kind of working well and going smoothly into the 2024 election um, so um, Richard Ramsey asked um, do you foresee that that being possible? That's just a nice easy question then. <laughs> um, I, I think um, I think just going back to one of the other points, one of the things that makes me particularly angry at the moment is the narrative, especially on social media, that totally dismisses the concerns of the unionist and the loyalist community in Northern Ireland. They have a, 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 a right to have their voice heard and uh, understood. It's not just about letting people speak, it's about understanding as well. I think that's really important to, to say. As far as where we are, as, as where business can, can feed in, you know, you, you were absolutely right that there was a dearth of uh, a complete lack of, uh, of engagement with the UK government for a long time until that uh, command paper of, of, of April uh, last year. And in response, we put out, uh, the Northern Ireland Business Brexit Working Group uh, put out uh, a paper um, with 67 questions in it. We then refreshed that in October and it then had 82 questions. And there's still a lot of questions that need answered. But one of the things that happened, we haven't had that same level of communication and input into what the EU's thinking is. Um, I have, have, have uh, you know, have, have those conversations regularly, but there's not a formal way for us as a business community. So it's reliant on people having contacts rather than having a formalized communication system. And that for me is key. Um, again, when it comes to changing UK uh, EU rules, when it comes to anything like that, it needs to be done with business, not to business. And, and we need to have that uh, strengthening of, of communication. And that would actually help with some of the work with the, the unionist community and some of the work with the, the other communities in, in Northern Ireland. I told the EU uh, a year ago that they needed to work on hearts and minds and never uh, has that been more important than now. People need a, a release valve. People also need to feel that they are being listened to. And it doesn't matter whether it's business or, or, or one of the two or, or three communities in Northern Ireland, those people say that they're, they're neither. On as far as the uh, gin and tonic, uh, as a teetotaler, I wouldn't know about that. Um, but the, the, uh, as far as the, the, the gin and tonic at that stage, um, there are opportunities and we've already seen that. Um, yesterday, there was an announcement that two agri-food uh, companies in Northern Ireland had signed significant contracts. One was, uh, I think, 500 million uh, with, uh, 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 or 500, sorry, uh, with, um, with, with Aldi, another one with, with, with uh, uh, Lidl. And those 
are for the European market, Ireland and the European market. So those contracts were enabled by the Northern Ireland Protocol. Yeah. What we have to get to is a p place, you know, where we need immediate stability. So we, we need those extensions because there are going to be opportunities, but we need to make sure that we don't lose uh, a lot of business on the way to getting uh, to those uh, opportunities. The other point on, on 2024, 2024, just as much as the, 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 the misnomer uh, of the transition period, 2024 is not the deadline for this. 2022, we have a year to win over hearts and minds. We have a year to show that the Northern Ireland Protocol works because in May 2022, we will have those assembly elections and those assembly elections will determine the makeup of the assembly that takes that vote in 2024. So, you know, the, the, the whole piece about communication, the whole piece about uh, hearts and minds and the whole piece about flexibilities to show business and communities that this protocol uh, can work needs to happen immediately. Thank you. Um, Katie, I just wanted to uh, ask you one of the questions that's been raised in the chat about uh, what role the um, British Irish institutions established under the Good Friday Agreement could play in kind of overseeing or um, kind of thinking about uh, the protocol more more widely? Yeah, it's a great question because um, obviously, I mean, in Northern Ireland, we're kind of familiar with multi-level governance um, and it's been an important part, of course, of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement and the fact that that's not just about North-South, but also East-West. And uh, the Centre for Cross-Border Studies um, and others have been really emphasising the importance of those strand three bodies for some time now. Um, and not least because in the British Irish Council, um, we have the capacity for the various parts of the United Kingdom to discuss matters of obviously common interests and importance. Now, in the context of the EU, they could have you know, been discussing matters in relation to European integration. But this British Irish Council, Council, of course, includes Ireland as well as the various parts of the UK and Northern Ireland there on its own two feet. And I think there is, um, there, it's, it's more than time now to refresh um, the, um, the remit of those bodies in light of the huge transformation that's taken place for British Irish relationship. Um, and I, I would never, uh, you know, I'd really point to the fact that that British Irish relationship, of course, it underpins the Good Friday Agreement. But now it's been superseded, if you like, by the UK-EU relationship. Um, and the UK-EU uh, Joint Committee has responsibility not only for trade within the UK's internal market as it relates to Northern Ireland, but also North-South cooperation. So we have the East-West and the North-South dynamics all completely changed now. We're in a process of flux anyway. And so again, to, re to repeat the point, I mean, these bodies, the Good Friday Agreement recognise the importance of institutionalising and formalising relationships. That doesn't mean you can't have the ad hoc informal, which is part of the richness of relations across these islands, but you do need those formal bodies. They go hand in hand. And it's it's way past time to sort of emphasise the importance of this. And I really think it's important for the, the point of view of the UK government as well. It possibly goes against the grain of some of the... Um, some of the... the uh, maybe not to put too fine a point on its centralizing tendencies in the UK government at the moment, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Scotland. Um, the logic of the British Irish Council and those strand three bodies is about the importance of conversation and cooperation for common interests. It's going to be very, you know, it's going to be much more difficult outside of the EU. Let's put, you know, you can't, um, you shouldn't downplay that. It's all the more important for making the most of those bodies where we have that regular communication. Great, thank you. Um, and Neil, I wanted to you know, ask a similar question to you. I mean, obviously we saw the relationship between the UK government and the Irish government um, be slightly tested over Brexit. Do you think there's an opportunity for a new reset here? Um, and as well as that, obviously, um, Northern Ireland will be, still be subject to EU law in some areas, but will no longer be part of a member state. Um, do you see some of these bodies, um, either North-South bodies or, or East-West bodies, as an opportunity to discuss some of those um, areas where there might be shared interest in policy that's made at an EU level. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there. Um, first of all, yeah, relations were tested, 
but to the extent to which they were tested, I strongly believe were overplayed in the media. And the personal relationships were so important at the tougher times, such as between David Liddington and Simon Coveney, uh, texting and calling at regular times, and not just to, to say it to him, but Simon's uh, chairmanship in the Northern Irish Affairs Committee, his outreach work has been really important. And it gets the essence of the, the strength of the relationship, because I think it has to be remembered. Before Ireland and the UK joined the EEC, Irish and British ministers never met. You know, it might have been once or twice a year. And then you went into the position of meeting at European Council meetings or Council of Ministers meeting on such a level of regularity. The same with politicians. It used to be like this is a bit of a history lesson, but it was groundbreaking when Terence O'Neill first visited Dublin and Sean Lamas went to Belfast. And I know that is ancient history in a political context, but it shouldn't be forgotten because as Katie rightly puts out, and I've been saying this for a while, the Strand 3 institutions, the Good Friday Agreement, provide a really unique opportunity, not just for the, the British-Irish relationship and the North-South relationship, but that EU-UK relationship, because Ireland will be the UK's best friend within the EU. Um, we have shared responsibilities, shared a culture, shared economic ties, shared history. Um, and we have, through those institutions, formal legal measures to maintain a bilateral relationship that is stronger than any of the other member states. And that shouldn't be dismissed, but those institutions have been greatly underutilized. Um, and the British Irish Intergovernmental Conference came back. Uh, it was quite it was used quite strongly during the Brexit negotiation mm -hmm. process, the British Irish Council, the North South Ministerial Council, and the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, the plenary of which I'll be attending on Monday. And we need to see these as not just necessarily pleasant weekend retreats where we talk about things, but actually substantive policy formulating and coordination ideas. So one thing that I've said that it would be great if the British Irish Inter Intergovernmental Conference met uh, the week prior to whatever thematic European Council meeting. So you had uh, our Minister for Agriculture meeting the Secretary of State um, a week before the European uh, Agricultural Council. Because Ireland and the UK were great partners when the UK was in the EU. And then that shared responsibility of the north-south dynamic. Um, one of the big policies of the current Irish government is the shared island concept. And I think one thing that's really important from a, and this is very much in the discussion on the island, is that there's no preconditions there. This isn't a move towards some sort of border pole or forcing the discussion on a united Ireland. That may be, and I have no problem saying, that is something I aspire to at some stage in my lifetime, but it's not the clear and present responsibility of any public representative on this island. We need to make the protocol work. We need to make the institutions, the Good Friday Agreement work. And we need to make sure the communities are actually being heard, as Aidan said, but they're relating that people from Cork are quite simply going uh, to the North Antrim coast on their holidays, that academics in Queens are being able to collaborate with academics in my alma mater, UCD, and things like that. And then Ireland in turn has that responsibility because Northern Ireland is subject uh, to EU rules to tap into that concern to listen to Northern Irish business leaders and politicians. And we need to have that mature relationship that whatever the badge of the identity is left at the door, because it really doesn't matter who's selling you uh, your sausages, what, what the butcher's politics are. If you want your dinner, you want your dinner. And that's sort of really basic politics. But it's those are the reasons Simon and I sought elective office. Those are the reasons we want to um, kind of get over in the next couple of weeks and months and years. But they are eminently achievable. Um, but it's it's not easy. But nothing in easy nothing in politics is easy. Thank you. Um, we're kind of uh, nearly running out um, of time here. It's been a it's been a really fascinating discussion. But I wanted to end on a kind of positive note. Um, Aidan's yes, already. Yes, could, 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 could I could I just underscore what Neil said? I, I, yes, absolutely. Because, um, that was it. It was incredibly heartwarming to hear. But I also thought it was incredibly important as well, because I think it underscores entirely what is now an incredibly close and, and, and intertwined uh, relationship between uh, UK and the Republic. Um, I thought there was a lot of good stuff in there, what he was suggesting about a modus operandi for the future. And I think that's to be encouraged. You know, we, we have to stay uh, as thick as thieves, our, our, our two countries, because it's in our mutual interest uh, so to do. So, um, let's not lose the importance of what Neil has just said, because I think that's phenomenal, probably one of the most important things we've had in this session this afternoon. Thank you, Simon. Um, yes, the, I 
I think that's really, really interesting. Um, uh, yeah, as I said, I just wanted to end on a quick note on the kind of positives. Um, Aidan, you kind of already mentioned some of them just then. Um, but obviously, Michael Gove has said that the protocol is the best of both worlds. The Scottish government have been asking for kind of similar arrangements to the protocol since it was negotiated. Um, and I think we had some comments last week from the head of Invest NI who said that the protocol was already attracting businesses to Northern Ireland because of its kind of unique access to the EU and GB markets. Um, are we starting to see, you know, concrete examples of, of some of the opportunities that it presents? Um, we're kind of hoping to do a kind of a quick fire, but Aidan, perhaps you wanted to go first. Okay, I, I want to point out, I have never used best of both worlds in this because <laughs> it's simply something that I, I, I don't see. Um, <laughs> and when, it, when the protocol came out, um, I uh, was very vocal in saying that the Prime Minister had not listened to Northern Ireland business and had not listened to Northern Ireland communities. However, it is law and we are trying to make it work. Business is pragmatic. That, that is the biggest thing that we can get across. The business is pragmatic and we are making it work. There are challenges. I've outlined earlier what um, support that we're going to need. But those two contracts yesterday um, with Aldi and, and Lidl, they were enabled by the Northern Ireland Protocol. And it's really important that we do look at what the benefits are. We do look at what the economic and social uh, future for Northern Ireland is, but it's really important that we try and take all sectors and all communities with us. That is the challenge, not just for us in the business community, but for the UK and the EU. Thank you. Um, Simon, if I could go to you next, I'd be interested if you think there's more the UK government could do to help businesses take advantage of some opportunities that might be there. Of course, and, you know, we are, <laughs> we're early days. Uh, and we're dealing with a pandemic um, as well. This is an evolutionary process. I think the key thing, th 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 sorry, th there were two key things. First of all, GB business needs to have um, a, a very sort of rapid explainer with regards to what they need to do. They're, they've already caught up leaps and bounds in the last few weeks, but we just need to make sure that everybody's on the same page. But the, but the second, and I think the most important thing, which then leads to what Aidan was saying about people investing and creating jobs and wealth and opportunity, et cetera, is for everybody to understand that the protocol is here to stay. Uh, it's not a, for want of a better phrase, it's not a one night stand, it's a long term relationship. And once everybody knows that, and everybody knows that all of the politics are vested in it, then everybody wants to make it work and work to its optimum. And that is, as I say, whether you want to use the phrase, uh, the best of both worlds, there are some significant opportunities here available to business in Northern Ireland, not available, I have to say, to my constituents in Milford, but available to businesses in Northern Ireland. And I really hope and actually believe, because they're an entrepreneurial bunch of people, that they will grasp the opportunities with both hands, run with the ball and, and, and score the try. Thank you. Casey, did you have any um, thoughts to add? Um, no, just one thing, and that is about how important it is for clarity and consistency in the information that's being put out. So part of the problems at the moment vis-a-vis -vis the protocol, including politically, is just a misunderstanding about uh, the, the nature of the um, vote in the Assembly, for example, this idea that it would get rid of the whole protocol, whereas it wouldn't, and it would put it back in the UKU hands, but also around Article 16, the UP's um, petition to um, trigger Article 16 says it will give unfettered access to GBNI. It won't do that. So I think there's much more need for consistency and clarity, from, particularly from the UK government, about what the protocol means and the elements of it, in order to create the environment in which different sectors will benefit or, or struggle in different ways um, and uh, so that just the when we get to that point of it no longer being that sort of um, battle and tension that will be a really uh, useful moment for sort of seeing the way forward for this place. Thank you um, and Neil I'll, I'll give you the final word uh, what do you think uh, you know the Irish government in the EU can can do to get us to that gin and tonic stage we were talking about earlier? Yeah um, sounds great gin and tonic with nuts in company in a bar would be brilliant uh, for at any stage at this time of the pandemic. I think, <laughs> um, I think we've remarkably, for the year we're in, we've gone through an hour without mentioning the pandemic, um, which is dominating and in turn devastating so many lives. But certainly I think um, 
And Katie said, or no, Aidan said in relation to the hearts and minds, if I could convince the European Commission how to win over hearts at any level, um, it would be a totally different project. But that is what's going to be needed, that human political nature and exhausting every opportunity to talk, even with people who don't want to talk. And I think the EU in particular needs to be extremely generous with its time, not necessarily to the British government, to the Irish government, but to the people, businesses and politicians of Northern Ireland. And if we prioritise that, there is absolutely opportunities um, on a business level and at every other level. And we need to realise every single opportunity. Here, here. Thank you. Great. What a, a positive note to end on there. Um, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, thank you so much to our panellists for, for a really great discussion and to everyone at home for, for tuning in. Um, as always, we'll be to follow, following any new developments in this area, particularly around the Joint Committee. So do keep an eye on our website and Twitter pages. Um, if you want to listen back, the audio and the video will be available shortly on YouTube and up on our podcast, podcast channel, IFG Live. Um, so final thing to say is uh, thank you for tuning in and please do join us again for more of our IFG live discussions. Thanks very much.